the nature of the mind is that it doesn't sit around just doing nothing. It's not simply a passive receiver of outside stimuli. It's out there looking for things. It's constantly active. Because it knows there's dangers all around. And so the question that's always in the back of the mind is, what next? What next? What do I do next? What do I do next? What should I do next? It's because this is the nature of the mind. The Buddha's basic teachings are basically about things we should do. He's giving us the advice we're looking for. As he said, when we first encounter pain in our lives, think about it. You're a child, newly born. You don't understand language. You come out of the womb, and the first thing you do is you cry. There's pain. It's something about the human life. There's pain coming in, pain going out, and a lot of pain in between. So even before we knew language at all, we knew that there was pain. And even though we had been able to formulate the question or articulate the question, the basic question was, how do we get out of this? And as we learned how to articulate it, it came down to two things. One is, do we're simply bewildered. And two, is there anyone who knows a way out of this pain? And so as I said, the Buddha is offering us answers to those questions. This is one of the reasons why, even though he wasn't the sort of person to go around picking fights with people, if there are people who said that the things you do in the present moment can't make any difference in your experience or what you're experiencing right now, he would go and argue with them. He said, do you really teach this? Some people would say, what you experience right now is totally shaped by past karma. Others say that it's determined by some creator God. And others would say, well, there's no real cause for it all. It just happens that way. Nothing you can do about it. And he says, if you teach these things, you're leaving people bewildered. You have no basis for deciding what should and shouldn't be done. Which, he said, was the teacher's main responsibility. Both to ensure you that, yes, what you do does make a difference. And so your question of what should and shouldn't be done is a good question. And then he offers answers. The two categorical teachings, what they call Egangsa Dhamma in Pali, are instructions. The first is unskillful actions should be abandoned, skillful actions should be developed. These will be actions in thought, word, and deed. So there's some shoulds there. And then the other Categorical teaching builds on that. You've got the Four Noble Truths. And here, too, there are shoulds. Each truth is not just something to sit around and talk about. Suffering, the First Noble Truth, is to be comprehended to the point where you have dispassion for it. The Second Noble Truth, craving, is to be abandoned. The Third Noble Truth, the cessation of suffering is to be realized. And the fourth noble truth, the way to the cessation of suffering is to be developed. So the Buddha here is giving you some shoulds. When you sit and wonder, what should I do next? What should I do next? Well, look at what you've got. And he gives you both the shoulds and also the places to focus your attention. When you have a sense that you're suffering, he doesn't simply say that there is suffering. He says the suffering is something that you're doing. You're clinging to the five aggregates of form, feeling, perceptions, thought fabrications, and consciousness. And why are you doing that? Because of craving. Now that right there is pretty radical. Most of us, when we suffer, tend to focus on the causes coming from outside. This person did that, that person did this, the society's like this, the weather's like that. But as he says, or as John Lee says, 
Those things are just the shadow of suffering. The real suffering is the clinging inside. So he's focusing your attention inside. And the same with the cause, the same with the suffering itself. It's, it's all happening inside here. And as it turns out, the solution is also found inside. You take those same five things that, when you cling to them, cause our suffering. And you can turn them into the path. Like right now, we're sitting and meditating. And you're focusing on the breath. That's form, the form of the body. You're creating a feeling of well-being by the way you focus on the breath. Not too long, not too short, not too heavy, not too light. Just right. You have a perception that you hold in mind where the breath is coming in, where the breath is going out, how it moves through the body. As for fabrication, you talk to yourself in the beginning about how to get the mind and the breath to fit together snugly. The adjustment work you have to do. Technically, that's called direct of thought and evaluation. And then finally, consciousness. You're aware of these things right here. What you're doing is you're taking these things that we normally hold on to and carry around. And you're turning them into a path. It's like you have a load of bricks over your shoulders. Instead of carrying them around on your shoulders, you put them down and use the bricks to pave a path that you can walk on. Or in the Buddha's image, you have to cross over a river. This side of the river is dangerous, the other side of the river is safe. But there's no bridge and there's no regular boat going back and forth. So you have to make a raft. What do you do? Where do you get the materials for the raft? You get them from this side of the river. The trees have twigs and branches and leaves. Okay, you cut those and then you tie them together in the right way. And then you hold on to that raft as you swim across the water. You get to the other side, you can let the raft go. Because you've reached safety already. You don't need to carry it around in your head. But to get there, you have to take what you've got right here, right now, and turn it into a path. Now, to think in these ways is called appropriate attention. In other words, the Buddha gives you a list of things that are appropriate to pay attention to here in the present moment. Pay attention to your clinging. Pay attention to your craving. Pay attention to the things you can do to put an end to the clinging and craving. And not only pay attention, remember what your duties are. We read about people in the time of the Buddha who listened to his dharma and came to awakening, just listening to the talk. And you wonder, why is it they just listen to a talk and they're able to gain awakening? We listen to many talks, we don't gain awakening. Well, the answer is they didn't just listen. As the Buddha said, they developed five qualities inside. The first three of the qualities have to do with respect. You don't look down on the person giving the talk. You don't look down on the drama he's talking about. And then three, you don't look down on yourself. In other words, when they talk about things like the noble truths, the duties of the noble truths, you're capable of doing these things if you have that conviction. Because that's the, the normal reaction will be then to look inside to see what how the Dharma talk applies to what you're doing right now. That's where the appropriate attention comes in. You listen to a Dharma talk, how is it related to the suffering you're creating right now? How is it related to the cause of suffering you're creating right now? What advice is it giving you to change things so that your actions actually put an end to suffering? And when you think in those ways, Pay attention to the present moment in those ways. That's appropriate attention. You listen to a Dharma talk, that's where you pay attention inside, too. And finally, the fifth quality is that you're single-minded. You don't let your mind wander away. You stay right here. Listen to the Dharma. See how it applies inside. If it doesn't apply inside, we just let it go. Those people who, in the time of the Buddha, listened to the Dharma were able to gain awakening. 
It's because they were doing these things. And these are things that we can all do. It's because of this that the Buddha said, the internal quality that's most conducive to awakening is this quality of appropriate attention. Now notice, this is appropriate attention. It's not just bare attention. We hear so much about Buddhist meditation and having to do with bare attention or bare awareness. But the Buddha never used those terms. When he talks about the act of attention, he says there are two kinds. There's appropriate and inappropriate. And appropriate attention is framed in the terms of those categorical teachings, either the, what you should do to abandon unskillful actions and what you should do to develop skillful actions, or what you should do to carry out the duties of the Four Noble Truths. The Buddha is taking this tendency that the mind has to approach experience in an active way. And he's giving you instructions. This is how you use that tendency of the mind to your advantage. If we have this active tendency of the mind, but we do it in ignorance, it's going to cause suffering. But if we do it with knowledge, this is what he's providing us. He's providing us points to examine, directing our attention to the right place, giving us a vocabulary, giving us instructions for how to do this, how to do that. And his teachings on karma, which sometimes seem far away in dealing with past lives and future lives. But they're also relevant here, too, because, as I said, he said that what you do right now can have an impact on what you're experiencing right now. The karma coming in from the past is raw materials, the twigs and the branches. But what you're doing right now makes a difference between whether the twigs and the branches just sit there on the side of the river or whether you tie them together and make them into a raft. Or worse than just sitting here, the worst thing, of course, is just piling them up on your shoulder and carrying them around. You have the choice. And when the Buddha points out that, yes, you, your actions in the present moment, your thoughts, your intentions in the present moment do make a difference, he's giving you a real basis for deciding there is such a thing as what should be done and what shouldn't be done. He says if you get a, a teaching that doesn't even give you a basis for deciding what should and shouldn't be done. You're still left bewildered the way you were when you were a little child. Especially when you're told there's nothing you can do. That's making you totally helpless. But when you realize there are things you can do and they do make a difference, and then he tells you what are the best things to do. Okay, This is his gift to you uh, as a teacher. Providing for your protection, ending your bewilderment, and answering that question, is there someone who knows a way to put an end to the suffering? This is how it's done. Now it's up to you to do it. 